So you've located your box of photographic heirlooms and you're feeling confident that this is finally the month you're going to tackle digitizing everything. You take a deep breath, you open the box, and you begin to sort. And as your piles are made, you notice a growing amount of negatives, and slides, and random film from generations gone by. The thought creeps into your mind, can I actually do this project? I'm Craig with Roots Family History, and I'm going to walk you through it. First, let's identify a few common film types so that you can determine what type of film you have. This will help you be prepared to purchase a proper film scanner for your project. The most common film type was 35 millimeter film, easily identified by the sprocket holes on the top and bottom of the film. The smallest film ever made and used was 110 film. This stands only about 5 eighths of an inch tall and has a single perforation on one side of the film. 126 film is about the same height as 35 millimeter film, but the frames are square and there is a single perforation on one side of the film. 127 format film is less common, but was also done in either color negatives or a slide. You might have a few frames or a few strips of a 120 format film. This is about six centimeters tall and each frame is between six by four centimeters all the way up to six by nine centimeters. You may also have a few films that are large format four by fives. Each of these film formats were also done in slides and you may have varying slide formats to be scanned. Now that you've identified the type of film you have, you're ready to buy a film scanner. As you're looking for a good film scanner, I highly recommend this article on bhphotovideo.com called Scanning Film, A Buying Guide. It's a great article and in here you'll find information on scanners ranging from $40 all the way up to $3,000 in the software that drives them. A lot of good information here. Uh, we'd say that we definitely recommend something in the mid-range at least. These inexpensive scanners don't really produce great quality scans and they take forever to scan each frame. The mid-range scanners are going to be able to produce really nice shadow detail and highlight detail in your scans. They're also going to be able to scan at a high enough resolution for great quality prints and that scanning time per frame is cut by half or more. So it's a really good, good thing to be looking into there. We usually find that anything under about $300 is not really going to be worth buying. So once you find a couple of options that interest you, make sure you watch a couple of video tutorials on them and find some things specifically about your model choices, read plenty of reviews. After that you can feel confident moving forward with one of your options. For our purposes today we're going to be using an Epson V700 flatbed scanner. This particular model has several film trays that come with it and accommodate a variety of types of film including 35mm, 4x5 film, 120 film, and slides. So this, so this is a really good option to use with a variety of types of films. I've previewed four frames of 35mm color negative film and before we get into using some of these tools to prepare our scan, just want to touch on one brief principle that I call garbage in, garbage out. In essence, if we do not take the proper steps to set up our scanning, we're not going to get the best quality when we're done. We're going to put garbage in and we're going to get garbage back out. We get what we put into it. So a couple things to make sure this does not happen. First, it's always best to wear some cotton gloves. Fingerprints take a long time to touch out in editing software and we can make sure that this does not happen to us if we simply put on the proper gloves. Next, dust off your negatives with some canned air or a film brush. Once again, a major time savings in Photoshop or another editing software. And also, let's make sure our negatives loaded properly. Were they warped? Is there something that we can do to make it a little better? Have we followed all the instructions by the manufacturer on that scanner? When all these things are done, you can be assured that your preview scan is going to be the best possible and the final product is going to come out as well as that scanner could have produced. With your film properly loaded, you're ready to get scanning. Now it's time for a few tips. First, get to know your scanning software as best you can. Go through all the drop-down menus, all of the plus menus, find everything that you have at your disposal to make the best scan possible, and honestly play around. 
Scans get a lot better when you start to understand your software and what it's going to do. Here's a few pointers with this particular software. First, let's talk about dots per inch when scanning film and negatives. You're probably used to hearing 300 dpi. 300 dpi is equivalent to the same size as the original image area. For example, if you scan a 4x6 photo at 300 dpi, you're capturing a scan that is capable of holding up to a maximum of 4x6 at print resolution. 600 dpi then is equivalent to double resolution or enlarging that 4x6 print to an 8x12. A 600 dpi scan of an 8x10 would yield an image capable of a 16x20. We're not talking about prints anymore though, we're talking about film. Film is much, much smaller. If we're going to scan a 35mm negative at 300 dpi, it would give us a scan that is just shy of an inch and a half wide or tall, whichever way it runs. If 600 dpi is double re resolution of the actual image area, then 900 dpi is 3 times, 1200 dpi is 4 times, and 2400 is 8 times. If we were to scan our 1.4 inch wide negative at 2400 dpi, that would give us an image roughly 11 and a quarter inches in the long dimension. That's close to the equivalent of scanning a 3.5 by 5 or 4 by 6 photo at 600 dpi. At Roots, it's very useful when your software tells you what size in terms of megabytes your image will be when the scan is completed. A 3200 dpi scan from a 35 millimeter negative or slide is going to get you at about 36 megabytes. We recommend archive scans to be done between 30 and 50 megabytes. That'll allow somebody to print up to an 11 by 14 print very comfortably in the future without any hassle. Now let's take a look at some more in-depth options that your scanning software may provide. I personally enjoy pulling up a histogram on my scans. This little black area, which is known as the histogram area, tells me where the data information is on a scale of dark to light in my image. You might have an auto color restoration feature with your software. You may want to just toggle this off and on to see if it makes a major change with your particular frame. As I select another frame here, we'll try off and on. Sometimes this restoration is really good, sometimes it doesn't do a very good job. We find that some, thing, some images that are extremely red or that are extreme to one color or another, it may do very well on. Be careful and use caution when you use this. This is not a fix-all. For example, this image here, I don't necessarily like how blue that image is getting in the background. So you may try toggling that off and on to see if it works on any particular image. This software, as you've seen, allows me to make several selections at one time and scan them all together. I'm going to select all four images now. And once again, being very careful to go back and select as much of that film area as possible so that I get the most out of this film scan as I can. If you notice this third area right here, we may want to check that histogram and look how much of that bin is being eliminated. Let's drag that over and see if we can capture more of that highlight detail. I like that much more than what it was showing as a as an option. In some low-end scanners, you probably won't have this option to be able to capture the rest of this information, and that could turn out very, very blasted out. Let's see this other one at the bottom. Try to adjust the histogram to catch as much of that as possible. Another feature that I enjoy about this software is having a tone curve correction available. For example, this image down here looks to be a little bit yellow. Um, possibly a little bit cyan, so I can grab these channels individually. Uh, on the red channel, if you grab this curve right in the center and drag it up, it creates a red. If you go beneath center, the opposite would be cyan, so we have red and cyan. So we may want to grab a little bit of red, the center green, green, and magenta, its opposites, its photographic opposite and perhaps we will grab blue 
and put a little blue into it. To me, that color is a little bit better than what we had before. As we learn to use the corrections that we have in our software, we're able to get the best quality scan straight out of the gate. This is going to save a lot of time in Photoshop or other software and is really going to save us a lot of time in the long run. Another option you have after previewing may be to do a zoom scan. This is an enhanced preview scan that makes the image quite a bit larger and can help us further make these decisions a little bit better. You'll notice as we switch anything about this preview around, we lose some of those previous corrections that we've done. So let's go back in and fine tune this particular scan, dragging the histogram to the right. Let's grab some of those tonal corrections that we have made with the curve. To recap our scanning tips today, start with a quality scanner that will properly archive your film. Use care while cleaning and loading your film to achieve the best possible initial results. Use the proper settings for capturing a film image versus a photograph. And finally, study your software's calibration and adjustment tools to optimize the actual scan.